relationship with the overseas territories. The time limit is one hour. Lord Bolton. Lord, sir, today's debate is timely, not only as it follows His Majesty's recent coronation that saw the gathering of our global British family, something I was pr proud to take part in in my capacity as Honorary Colonel of the Cayman Islands Regiment, but also the annual summit of the British Overseas Territories that followed, the Joint Ministerial Council held here in London, which by all accounts has been a great success. One of the reasons for that success is down to my noble friend, the Minister. I've had a close working relationship and interest in our OTs for many years. And if I'm not an interest that I, I have always found shared across government, but I can genuinely say that when it comes to government's interest and support to our OTs, we appear to have turned a corner. And that in no small part is that to my noble friend and his team at the FCDO. An obvious recent example of this would be uh, the timely and effective delivery of vaccines during COVID, which did much to reinforce the benefits to OTs of their enduring relationship with the UK. And without wishing to embarrass him, I would like to highlight the contribution of Mr. Adam Pyle in that delivery. A similar debate last week in the House of Commons had as its motion that this House is committed to upholding the interests of British overseas territories and their citizens, recognises the special historical, cultural and social bonds that bind the United Kingdom and overseas territories, ensures that British overseas territories' citizens' rights as British citizens are upheld, to defend the sovereignty and borders of OTs from foreign powers and to consider the unique circumstances of each territory when formulating policies which affect them. As a neat summary of where I am sure your Lordship's house would aspire our relationship with the OTs to be, that is a great one. Whilst each territory is unique in its relationship with the UK, the one thing that underpins that relationship is that all British OTs enjoy institutional link with the UK ultimately there. I'm sure the lords will join me in reaffirming our commitment to defending that principle. Spanning the globe, British OTs are, a, are as diverse in their geography as they are in their culture. One size simply does not fit all, and this requires both sensitivity and agility from HMG if it is to support the unique circumstances, constitutions, challenges, and opportunities of each territory. It is this challenge that I turn to first. I've always been slightly perplexed as to why that, that relationship is held by the FCDO. After all, our OTs are not foreign, not part of the Commonwealth other than through the UK membership, and only four of the 14 are eligible for development assistance. Whilst the FCDO may manage the relationship, it holds few, if any, of the levers of power to support OTs when required. Whatever the 2012 white paper may say, it is my experience that this arrangement leaves other government departments things these are not their responsibility. Take, for example, the recent events in the Turks and Caicos Islands, where they faced the double challenge of potentially being overwhelmed by Haitian migrants and a spike in violent crime. Both are areas of responsibility of the Home Office, but as we have discussed before, HMG support to TCI uh, when threatened by these challenges, left considerable room for improvement. I recently visited TCI with the Chief of the General Staff, yet when I raised my concerns to the Home Office on my return, it was clear to me that their impression was that this was a matter for the FCDO. Whilst I appreciate the Foreign Secretary and Prime Minister have now written to all government departments, reminding them of their responsibilities to OTs, it doesn't solve the structural problem that we have in government. More importantly, there is no guarantee their successors will be as committed, which is why I believe we should consider structural change. OTs need direct access to all government departments. I know my noble friend and FC coordination traffic control initiatives that OT needs, but surely from a machinery of government perspective, does my noble friend not think coordination of support to the OTs should be the responsibility of the Cabinet Office? For my remaining time, I simply want to highlight both some successes we have with our relationships with the OTs. The first success is one close to my heart and relates to the Overseas Territory Regiments. Last week, I chaired the Overseas Territory Regiments. First thanks both to the Governor and Command Officer of the Royal Bermuda Regiment, Lieutenant Colonel Ben Beasley, for facilitating this. 
We now have six OT regiments, the original four, the Royal Montserrat Defence Force, the Falkland Islands Defence Force, the Royal Bermuda Regiment and the Royal Gibraltar Regiment, all date back either in their current form or to their antecedent, antecedent units to the 1890s, whilst the two new units, the Cayman Islands Regiment and the Turks and Caicos Islands Regiment, to just 2019 and 2020 respectively. Following a visit to Montserrat in 2018 post-Hurricane Irma, in my capacity as Minister for the Armed Forces, I wrote to all of the OT governors without a regiment suggesting they create an army reserve unit within the territory to help deliver on island humanitarian assistance and disaster relief capability to deliver immediate post-hurricane support. I promised all support from the Ministry of Defence in their establishment and I'm delighted that despite both being created during COVID, the new regiments have been a success and are capable of delivering food, desalinated water and emergency, accom uh, and emergency accommodation as well as general assistance to the government in times of crisis. The purpose of the, conference, of the conference last week was to evolve the units to be able to assist each other in times of crisis, in addition to support from the UK. I would be grateful of the Minister's continued support in their development, and perhaps even encourage the British Virgin Islands to join the club, but also draw to his attention two minor issues. One is ensuring equality in medallic re recognition for the OT regiments in line with their UK counterparts, and with particular reference to the Royal Bermuda Regiment, supporting their campaign to have the battle honours of their two antecedent regiments, the Bermuda Militia Artillery and the Bermuda Volunteer Rifle Corps, transferred to the new regiment. It is a small but an emotive and important issue. The next success regards the environment. The 14 UK OTs collectively contain more than 90% of the biodiversity for which the UK is legally responsible under the Convention on Biological Diversity. To use the Cayman Islands as one example, the islands are home to more, th to more than 3,000 documented native species. Over the past 40 years, successive Cayman Island government administrations have worked to develop a comprehensive framework legislation and policy aimed at safeguarding the sustainable future of the island's natural environment. The Cayman Islands has led the world in protecting marine habitats. Currently, an impressive 48% of the Cayman Islands' nearshore coastal waters are protected through an enhanced marine protected area network. As a testament to the efforts of the Cayman Islands, with the backing of the UK government, the little Cayman uh, marine parks and protected areas, which I had the pleasure to visit last September, have been added to the tentative list to become UNESCO World Heritage Sites for their importance to marine biodiversity. Incredible natural beauty. I hope my noble friend will continue to support this application. I would also like to draw your Lordship's house to the role of some OTs in supporting the UK's imposition of sanctions on Russia. Cayman for joint with Russian rising after the 14th of April 2023 of 8.88 billion US dollars and 298.6 million euros respectively. And the OT's contribution to the Red Ensign Group, the UK flag state, made up of the 13 constituent British uh, maritime administrations of the UK, overseas territories and crown dependencies, is one of the leading flag states of the world and sits on the International Maritime is acknowledged for its technical leadership. It is an, ex an excellent example of the benefits of the UK OTs and Crown dependencies working together. I end, though, if I may, with three challenges to bring to my noble friend's attention. The first is student visas. Students with British OT passports require a visa to study in the UK. In order to obtain the necessary visa, students must submit an application to the nearest British High Commission located in another jurisdiction, which is often an expensive and lengthy process. The Minister knows this was an issue raised at this year's Joint Ministerial Council, and I'd be grateful if he could, if he could outline how the government intends to address the issue. This is Bill Gu the Gilgar Cade Board of Trustees announced that Girl Guiding has around 2,600 members in 36 countries and territories will no longer be part of Girl Guiding UK. These OT branches have been in place for nearly 40 years, and frankly, this seems to be an incredibly short-sighted step 
as we seek to, to foster yet stronger links between our OTs and the UK. Given that Girl Guarding UK will continue to support the Crown dependencies of Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man, can I simply ask my noble friend to use his best endeavours to encourage Girl Guarding UK to reverse this retrograde step? And the final point I wish to raise with my noble friend is regarding successive governments' frozen pension policy for pensioners living overseas, including those in certain British overseas territories from accessing a full state pension that increases in line with inflation. It has turned the out-of-state pension rating into a postcode lottery. Pensioners living in overseas territories that have an existing social security arrangement with the UK, such as Bermuda and Gibraltar, receive their full rated state pension, whilst others, for instance, living in Falklands or Lenot. These pensioners are not living in a foreign country, the British territory, so why is policy of uprating not applied equally to all of the overseas territories? My Lord, I will return to the values and rights uh, as introduced by Lord Lancaster in his excellent opening speech. But I'm afraid I think our views diverge. My Lords, people living in the British overseas territories deserve nothing short of the same respect for their human rights and fundamental freedoms as that available as living in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom government indeed recognized in 2012 that being an overseas territory entails responsibilities and that territory governments are expected to meet the same high standards as the UK government in the Index for Human Rights. The government also recognised, the UK government recognised, that it has a fundamental responsibility to promote the political, economic, social and educational territories to ensure their just treatment and their protection against abuses. It is within this spirit that I introduced on the 6th of July 2022 the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Overseas Territory Bill to make provision for the marriage of same-sex couples in the six overseas territories that currently do not permit same-sex couples to marry. My bill seeks to make what would now be regarded by most people in the United Kingdom and in the majority of overseas territories that have enabled same-sex marriage, a positive change law to allow same-sex couples to gain full and equal recognition of their loving and committed relationships. My Lord's ability to marry the person that we love is, I believe, an incontrovertible and fundamental human right. Every person in your Lordship's house today recognizes this because every person in your Lordship's house today would be horrified if they were told that their current marriage was not recognized by law or if they could not marry the person they loved. Denying two adults the right to marry on the basis that they are the same sex is outrage. And this house recognized that outrage and put an end to it in England and Wales when it played a pivotal role in passing the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Act 2013. In respect of those overseas territories that will not address the outrage of marriage in themselves, this house, I believe, my lords, must, in my view, take a lead. We can and should protect same-sex couples from the abuse of discrimination and legislate to grant them the right to marry. I have heard repeatedly all of the arguments against the UK doing this, that it is a sensitive issue that we must governments to choose for themselves. And if we don't, we are damaging our partnership with the overseas territories. My Lords, I reject every single argument I have heard against the UK Parliament taking a lead in this area for one simple reason. We are something so corrosive and destructive of human existence and dignity. And that is excluding people from access to marriage, which is universally recognized as a fundamental right. We do, I believe, have a moral obligation to act, perhaps in vain, that the government will find time for my bill to enable us to take a simple, simple step that will transform the lives in the UK at no cost to anyone. If the government 
will not find time for my bill, then we will return to this issue time and time again until it is settled. Justice must and will prevail. There are other areas of discrimination faced by LGBT people in some of the British overseas territories, and the government must also address these. Inequality and discrimination diminish every single level of a civilized society. In conclusion, my lords, I want to take this opportunity to thank Professor Paul Johnson, OBE, Executive Dean at the University of Leeds, for working with me to design the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Overseas Territory Bill. Professor Johnson is known to many noble lords for his ongoing work in this house and the other place in designing legislation to advance equality for LGBT people, not least in respect of enabling those in the United King Kingdom shamefully mistreated because of their sexual orientation to access disregards and pardons something which, with my noble friend and ally, Lord Lexton, we continue to press the government to fully deliver upon. In closing, my lords, I thank the noble Lord, Lord Lancaster of Kim Bolton, for securing what I believe is an extremely important debate. My lords, it's a great pleasure to follow the noble Lord, Lord Cashman, and to offer green support for his private member's bill, uh, whatever we can do. And also to thank the noble Lord, Lord Lancaster of Kim Bolton for securing this debate. And like the noble Lord, Lord Lancaster, I'm going to briefly reference the issue of frozen pensions because it is a huge issue. 500,000 pensioners living overseas who cannot access a pension that increases in line with the inflation. Um, many of those pensioners live in the overseas territories and it is essentially turning um, the rest of their life into a lottery, a postcode lottery. So um, pensioners living in overseas territories such as Bermuda and Gibraltar received their fully uprated state pension, while those in the Falkland Islands, the Caymans or Anguilla see their pensions fall in value year on year. Some of them get as little as £20 a week. And just to pick one example um, that's been shared with me, Roger Edwards, a Falklands War veteran, lives in the Falklands and now receives a state pension of just £106.50 a week compared to the full basic state pension of 156 uh, pounds 20 a week, losing 1,800 pounds a year as a result. Uh, I also, if I was going to do a checklist, would note in this debate that there's, um, I'd like to very much talk about the economic crime, covering it in the economic crime um, uh, report stage. I'm going to park that on one side. What I most focus on in the time available is an issue that I've, I've pre-warned the noble Lord the Minister about which is specifically the issue of Falkland Islands and more broadly carbon emissions um, and climate impacts um, of what's happening in the Falkland Islands. Now, I very much fear there is actually a considerable degree of confusion in the government about this situation. And I'm going to cross-reference a couple of written questions that I have put to the government and responses that really don't quite seem to add up. The first of these is HL 6972, um, which was answered on the 3rd of April. My question was about the steps the government was taking to work with the Falkland Islands to complete an emissions inventory on any potential future fossil fuel development. Now, the answer I see, received from the noble lord, the minister said, um, as a self-governing overseas territory, economic development, including ex development and exploitation of hydrocarbons, is a matter for the Falkland Island government. Um, so essentially that answer appeared to entirely deny any responsibility at all here in Westminster. I then asked a further question um, on uh, the 27th of April, HL7503, um, about whether the climate change emissions from British overseas territories are part of the UK's total accounting for emissions and included in the net zero target for 2050. Now, the answer I received on that one is that emissions from the UK territory are in scope of domestic carbon budgets and the net zero target in, in accordance with section 89 of the Climate Change Act 2008. Um, so I'm, these two things don't seem to square up. This, the answer there further says the UK's ratification of the Paris Agreement, including the NDCs, is being extended to include the um, Crown dependencies and overseas territories. 
Now, I've been trying to make sense of this, how this all fits together. I think perhaps part of the issue is arising from the fact that on the 7th of March 2007, um, the UK uh, notified the UNFCCC uh, that it wished to um, include in the UNFCCC Bermuda, Cayman Islands and the Falkland Islands. Now, the, the um, UN documents indicate that shortly after that, the government of Argentina notified the Secretary General that it objects, objected to the territorial application of the UNFCCC. Now, I'm sorry, that's a very technical run through that I've just done, but I think the government is really not very clear on what's happening here. And I'm not necessarily expecting the Noble Lord, the Minister, to answer fully to this complicated tangle today, but I do hope the Noble Lord, the Minister, will commit to write to me afterwards to really outline exactly where the government sees the emissions for this. And this is also a much broader issue um, in terms of, I note, a very useful briefing, which I'm sure all the noble lords taking part in this debate will have received from the RSPB, looking at the crucial um, aspects of the British Overseas Territory and the climate emergency. Um, and that briefing notes that no UK government department has clear responsibility for supporting the territories on climate adaptation, and there is no strategy in place to do so. Now, I think this is a very serious issue that really needs to be tackled being briefly so in light of the countries, many of them have very absent development planning frameworks, both um, to the climate and to nature developments are going takes, and they simply don't have the resources really to do this. Now, returning to the issue of the funds, it's, it deserves to be noted that the Falklands has a current population of about 3,500, uh, which is growing at about 3% a year. But nonetheless, it also has an area that's half the area of Wales. So it's facing some very big issues. And the issues that it's facing in terms of carbon emissions, uh, particularly are the fact that uh, peat, um, the Falklands does have an absolutely amazing ecology. Um, it's a place where there are no native trees, amphibians or reptiles, interestingly, but tussock grass, which is the naturally dominant species, which when undisturbed can grow up to 10 feet high and is the fastest method of forming peat in the world when allowed to be undisturbed. Now, the other factor that's relevant to this is the Falklands are notably dry. The average rainfall ranges in some areas from 200 millimetres per year up to 600 millimetres per year. And the former end of that is definitely drought territory, even speaking from my Australian origins. And it's getting drier and the peat soil is getting out, is drying out and it's blowing away. There is also, of course, the issue of oil, um, a very, very large issue of oil. Um, the North Basin is thought to hold 580 million recoverable barrels of oil, a very, very large amount. And the government um, is very keen to see development of that uh, because they have a huge dependence on fisheries in terms of their budget. And these are issues that the UK government has real responsibility between working with and helping uh, the helping the Falkland Islands government as a democratically elected government to work with. So my lords, um, this is a really big issue that I really do not believe the government has got to grips with. I'm seeking to push to get to grips with. And I will, in the interest of full disclosure, disclose the fact that I was actually earlier this year in the Falkland Islands under the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme and I met with members of the Falkland Islands Assembly, local officials and others, and that's very much informed what I've been saying today. Well done, well done. My Lords, um, may I add my congratulations to my noble friend, uh, Lord Lancaster, uh, for having been successful in the ballot um, and for securing this very timely debate. My Lords, when the late Queen died last September, I had just arrived in Gibraltar um, with a parliamentary delegation. The newspapers the next day had the headlines, the Queen of Gibraltar has died. We were uh, fortunately able to sign the um, book of condolences in, in the governor's um, house and also to attend the firing of the 97-gun salute um, from the harbour by the Royal Gibraltar Regiment. But that 
together with the turnout of premiers and other high-ranking leaders of overseas territories uh, for the king's coronation, uh, proves uh, that His Majesty has, I believe, without doubt, the peoples of the overseas territories amongst his most loyal subjects. In part because of the coronation, but also because of the joint ministerial council, uh, which took place last week, and the uh, Yukata meetings, uh, and indeed the 40th anniversary um, celebrations or meetings uh, uh, and events that have taken place um, uh, uh, during this last year, uh, there has been a great deal of activity recently. This to um, thank the CPA World Parliamentary Association uh, for their <coughs> ongoing work, um, with, which is not always recognised, uh, but especially with the public accounts committees uh, from some of those uh, territories, which offer a successful financial sense. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the current Mr. Speaker's clear championship of these tiny territories and the warm welcome uh, that he always gives to Speaker's House. I think ongoing speakers ha have always been uh, very happy to um, uh, receive and support uh, overseas territories. Um, uh, but I think um, Lindsay is particularly active in this respect or particularly recognized in this respect. My Lords, over the years, I've introduced and part participated in numerous debates uh, uh, about the overseas territories. And I am an active member of the Overseas Territories or Party Parliamentary Group, as well as most of the bilateral um, uh, groups. Uh, and in preparing for this debate, I took a look at one of such debate that I introduced in February 1994. Well, the obvious changes since then are changing dependent reasons to overseas. And the fact that Hong Kong uh, was um, then uh, one of their number um, and uh, uh, very numerous in, in, in the numbers uh, of people uh, that it added to the statistics. Uh, and although Hong Kong is no longer an overseas territory, I think we still see a feeling of responsibility for the people of Hong Kong uh, and for uh, those who have been disadvantaged uh, by the changes. Um, and of course, in, uh, I, I, I stated in, in that um, uh, debate uh, that the numbers of people in the Big Cairn Islands was 58. And now, according to the library's excellent um, briefing for us, it appears that there are only 50 people uh, left on the Big Cairn Islands. Um, but the common factor, factors that I noted then uh, remain much the same. Uh, and they are uh, that they are all virtually all uh, uh, island communities. They're English speaking, and essentially they have the same legal but I then said, however, they on their needs, aspirations are done. There will be no blanket answer. Uh, and I realize, uh, I realize to all their needs, uh, but there are points of similarity and common interest uh, between them. So, in that sense, uh, nothing much um, has changed. And I have. Um, uh, Uh, motions in recent years um, to have further debates on, on the overseas territories, uh, but uh, unfortunately have not been as successful as my noble friend in, in the ballots. Um, my themes then would have been very much on the subject of climate change, uh, which has already been uh, referred to, uh, and on humanitarian and her and the uh, overseas territories, particularly in the Caribbean, uh, are, uh, are, it, it have great um, problems over the hurricanes and um, the, the, the 
recent ravages, and perhaps in particular, I should mention in this context, uh, Montserrat. Um, so I hope that my um, noble friend can give us some assurances um, that the um, Overseas Development Fund uh, are um, um, managed in with very much uh, the overseas territories in mind. Uh, the other issue of bi biodiversity, the noble lady, Lady Bennett has, has already referred uh, to the RSPB's um, um, very, uh, very comprehensive uh, um, briefing. Um, and uh, clearly since I think it's 84% of the UK's biodiversity um, is uh, in the various territories uh, of uh, the overseas territories, um, then that, that is, a, 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 again, an important issue uh, on which I hope, again, my noble friend um, will be able to give um, um, some assurances. Uh, I would rapidly like to mention the post-Brexit um, issues. such as um, the border issues for border. It's not only Northern Ireland that has um, border issues uh, as a result of Brexit. Um, and also uh, the Falklands, um, which um, uh, as its main export has um, squid uh, and the, the problems they've found in exporting and, and entry to the Europe. <laughs> also, there is the issue of the um, European Union funding, which went to the overseas territories, and uh, to what extent uh, this has now been replaced, as promised, uh, by our government. Um, so, once again, thank you again for giving us this opportunity. Uh, I look forward to the rest of the debate. I first declare a special interest in relation to the overseas territories. My father and grandfather uh, were Bermudian, so I feel a very special uh, part of uh, that island. Um, of course, uh, the noble Lord, Lord Lancaster didn't mention that it's actually a strong naval tradition uh, that we were there for, and certainly that was my father's part and grandfather's part in, in, in that island. I thank the Noble Lord for initiating this debate. It's a really important debate. And he mentioned last week's debate uh, in the Commons. And my noble friend, my honourable friend, uh, Stephen Dowdy, the Shadow Minister covering the overseas territories, uh, set out five key principles that would guide a future Labour government's relationship with overseas territories. And it's worth spelling out those five key principles again because they've reflected very much what the Noble Lord Lord Lancaster said, devolution and democratic autonomy, establishing clear consistency on constitutional principles, partnership and engagement, listening, the principle of nothing about you without you, partnership, a future strong and stable relationship between the United Kingdom of each of the overseas territories must be built on a mutual respect and inclusion. Indeed, that involves all government departments, not just the FCDO. Rights come with responsibilities, as the 2012 White Paper recognised. In our British family, we do share the same common values, as the noble lady mentioned. Certainly, our legal traditions, too. Obligations, a robust commitment to democracy, the rule of law, and liberty and the protection of human rights, including those of people living with disabilities, women and girls, and as my noble friend, Lord Cashman raised, the rights of LGBT plus people. The cause that my noble friend advanced is absolutely right. We all share in our family the same rights and we should all be treated in the same way. Advancement of good governance ensuring proper democratic accountability 
and regulation. And of course, as my honourable friend said in that debate, Labour is also committed that we will defend their security, autonomy and rights, including in the case of the Falkland Islands and Gibraltar. And I'm pleased to see the representatives of the Gibraltar government here this afternoon. The UK's overseas territories are each a cherished and important part of the global UK family, each one with its own nuances, which are too often overlooked and ignored. Far too often, the nature of the overseas territories is based on generalizations which fail to their use of each territory and its history. And I agree with that uh, when it comes to the overseas territories, one size fits all. Uh, my part firmly that the future of the overseas territories must be led first and foremost by the wishes of their people and kings will always be guided by the concerns and people of the overseas territories. And it's imperative that the relationship between the United Kingdom and each of those territories is built on mutual respect and trust, not just in terms of the FCDO, but across the whole government, as the noble Lord said in introduction. What we need is a very clear joined up strategy in the way the UK delivers for the overseas territories and its people. All too often we've seen oversights and bureaucratic issues which present unnecessary enduring difficulties for those countries, particularly to part British family as I said, there are obligations which must be fulfilled pertaining to the values we all share, including the protection of human rights and the advancement of good governance and ensuring proper democratic accountability. I think these are very important points. But I have some specific questions for the noble Lord Minister. Uh, two issues that I suspect are close to his heart, but primarily... <laughs> Can he tell us uh, how the government is across all departments collaborating with the overseas territories to deliver on sustainable development? How are we working to match those goals that are set out on the 2030 agenda? And of course, climate crisis poses a unique threat to the islands. Uh, as he said, most of our British overseas territories are all right can also provide an up on the overseas territories biodiversity strategy, which is so vital to their future. Turning more generally, I mean, under Chapter 11 of the UN Charter, uh, the UK has a responsibility to represent their interests at the, UK, at the UN system. How does the UK at the UN engage with the democratically elected leaders in the BOTs? How do we ensure that their voice is heard at every level. And of course, government taken to ensure proper security collab collaboration uh, is vital with the UK overseas territories, not only to ensure our geopolitical reach, but also to ensure that those policies relating to our defense and security and foreign policy are matched. And the noble Lord uh, mentioned sanctions, and I agree with him. Our overseas territories have been very strong in terms of implementing uh, those policies. But how are we not just supporting them in terms of adopting sanctions, but how are we ensuring that they have the capacity to properly implement them and monitoring? They're vital issues to ensure the future of our relationship globally. And I hope the noble Lord will reflect the positive elements that we're talking about, because I think we, across all parties, we share a genuine commitment to the overseas territories. Yeah. Um, let me start by thanking my noble, uh, noble friend, Lord Lancaster um, of Kimbolton, for tabling this debate, for giving the House an opportunity to discuss and celebrate uh, the with the My lawyer to ensure their 
the good governance and the prosperity. We also have a moral obligation to protect the safety of the inhabitants uh, of the territories, just as we do for inhabitants of the United Kingdom. And while we cherish our territories, I think the Noble Lord Collins is right to emphasize our partnership is built on mutual respect, as it must be. And I reiterate the same commitment that my predecessors have made. The UK government will defend the right of the territories to choose their own future. Now, as Minister of the OTs, I hosted recently the, well, all of the elected leaders of the overseas territories earlier this month for the 10th Joint Ministerial Council. And this came just a week after the leaders attended the coronation, uh, which gave us an opportunity to celebrate together the British family's shared history. And Noble Baroness uh, Hooper uh, made the point, I thought, very well that both in relation to the response of the overseas territories to the sad death of Her Majesty the Queen, but also their celebration of the King's and contribution to the King's coronation. And we were joined by ministers and officials from across the government at the JMC. Our discussions covered top priorities, migration, economic resilience, and essential services too. We made joint commitments to tackling urgent shared issues like the environment, financial transparency, and healthcare access. And while I'm pleased to say that we're making progress on a whole range of important issues, uh, it is also clear, and I will make this point for the record, that there is much more to do. There are shortcomings uh, that the government undoubtedly must address, some of which were highlighted by the noble Lord Lancaster. We have a fundamental duty to protect and support the territories, but the sad truth is that at times we have been found wanting. But I'm determined, and our Prime Minister has been clear, that our territories will be prioritised across the government. And I also take this opportunity to echo the remarks of Noble Lord Lancaster about the Foreign Office or the FCDO team, some of whom are behind me. Um, I'm very, very lucky to be able to work with such a diligent, hardworking, committed team uh, that goes well beyond the call of duty uh, in support of the overseas territories. But it is necessary, I think, for me to say, and it has been said by a couple of other speakers, that... While the FCDO is the lead department at the center, I have used that term air traffic control before, because that is, I think, an accurate reflection of our role with the OTs. We don't control the levers of delivery, and those are, exist elsewhere in other departments. So it is crucial that other departments step up and fulfill their reserved responsibilities to the overseas territories, whether it's the MOD providing vital logistical capabilities to respond to hurricanes, or whether it's the Home Office bolstering the border security of territories responding to uh, large levels of irregular migration. And beyond meeting our reserved responsibilities, departments can contribute to and learn from the British communities in these extraordinarily diverse and rich territories. We must do more. And I know the Prime Minister shares that view. He's written to all departments, directing them to fulfill their responsibilities and, crucially, to nominate a dedicated overseas territories minister uh, 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 who will liaise with me. And I'll convene regular meetings of these OT ministers to ensure that we are meeting our obligations. Noble Lord Collins uh, um, asked uh, about the, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of, the, the, I'm not sure he used the term, the OT strategy, but he was talking about a government strategy in relation to the OTs. And that strategy is underway. The FCDO is leading that work, but it, again, has to be a whole of government effort and it must involve the territories themselves. Uh, and let me just return briefly to the question the Noble Lord uh, uh, Lancaster raised about why the SCDO should be the lead department within government on this. And it, it, it's a difficult question to answer. There's no obvious right or wrong. I just say that I think that our staff working in the OTs are experienced at working overseas, that our ambassadors and UK missions are joined up to advocate for the OTs internationally, to defend their sovereignty, especially uh, in relation to things like the rights of the and as well. A number of ambassadors have played a really crucial role in securing support uh, to uh, for the islanders and their right to determine their own future. And I hope that my noble friend is reassured that the Prime Minister, the Foreign Secretary, and I are completely committed to ensuring that the government delivers for the territories. And noble Baroness Hooper made the point about the Speaker, and I would simply echo this, uh, her remarks. The Speaker is a champion for the overseas territories, and he's been superb. Now, of course, the ambition of all territories is to be economically self sufficient. Um, but where this is not possible, we support them with ODA, Overseas uh, Development Assistance. And the OTs continue to have our, the first call on our development budget. And I'm proud to spread pressure across the whole of ODA. The FCD behind me were able to increase official development assistance 
uh, to the eligible territories. This year we'll provide 85 million to the governments of St. Helena, Montserrat, Tristan de Cunha and Pitcairn. And that will account for between 60 and 95% of the territory, territory government and will provide essential services including education and health. In addition, we're investing many more millions in infrastructure in the territories. As an example, we're providing 30 million for St. Helena. Uh, we are providing 40 million for Montserrat, as well as four and a half million for Pitcairn and two and a half million for Tristan. Now, on the environment, uh, an issue that's been raised by all the speakers. Yes, please. Um, we are not short of time. Um, on St. Helena, uh, Many years ago, I, in opposition, I was privileged to travel St. Helena to make an assessment in opposition as to whether or not we would build them an airport. Uh, and after seven days of bobbing on a boat from Cape Town, um, I think my first decision was they could definitely, but could my, could my noble friend perhaps give an update on the success of that airport? Because, airport, because there were troubles to with. Thank you, noble lord. So I, I think I'm still limited to my 12 minutes. Yes, I am. So I'm going to be very, very brief. And, and I, I'm comfortable. Other than say, St. Helena, it's crazy, I know, but I don't write the rules. Um, but look, the theme of airports cropped up a lot during the JMC. The St. Helena have their working airport ascension. The, the, the t representatives arrived. They're on the inaugural flight. There's work on, ongoing in, in uh, BI and not guys, sorry, and Montserrat into the environment because I will run out of time and I've got quite a few issues to cover. We, we are investing um, significantly to protect the ecosystems and the biodiversity of the overseas territories, and they are of global importance. It's been said already that they harbor around 90, over 90% 90 of the UK's biodiversity, of Britain's biodiversity. They have numerous uh, endemic species, uh, they really are of global importance. And the CDO's Blue Belt program, I think, is one of the great conservation stories uh, of my lifetime. Uh, it now has, it, we, we support it with around 40 million of funding this year. The program now protects four and a half million square kilometers of ocean. That doesn't even include the Cayman project that my noble friend has mentioned, which is extraordinary. And yes, of course, I'm very, very supportive of their UNESCO uh, application. Uh, we have invested uh, more than 45 million pounds over the last decade in biodiversity and conservation projects. Um, and I'm thrilled that DEFRA has committed a further 10 million pounds uh, each year until 2025. And I hope we'll go beyond that too. We've also worked very closely in response to the question by Noble Collins to ensure that the voices of our overseas territories are amplified and magnified uh, in uh, UN climate change and biodiversity summits. We did that in Glasgow, I think, very effectively. We continue to do it. Indeed, I spoke to the UAE just yesterday and made this point to them as well. In response to Noble uh, Baroness um, uh, Bennett, who asked about, which raised a number of issues, but first of all, on the, on the um, Falkland Islands, that it is their right. Um, uh, based on everything I understand, it is their right to pursue fossil fuel development. And we support uh, the Falkland Islands' right to develop their natural resources as we support the, all the overseas territories in that regard. But we're working very closely with the Falkland Islands government to build local capacity so that if and when the development would happen, it is properly regulated and it, it, to the highest possible environmental and safety standards. She asked about the um, emissions and where they are calculated. And I'm going to write to her on, on, on this topic to give a specific answer. But I'll just make the point that the OTs contribute very, very little in terms of emissions. Their contribution in terms of nature and biodiversity and marine ecosystems is vastly disproportionate. And I think it's right that we should be focusing more on that. We are working with the OTs who want to join the international agreements on emissions. Uh, but as I said, I'll get back to her with more details on that in the interest of time. She asked about who's in charge of or in, in government of, of this adaptation. Uh, and she rightly says that many of the overseas territories, almost all of them are islands and therefore are acutely vulnerable to the changes that we know are happening. Point made by Neville Collins as well. Uh, this is something that came up a lot, as you can imagine, at the JMC. It's very clear that the OTs have a particular vulnerability. The responsible minister is Trudy Harrison from DEFRA. She spoke at the JMC and we had a very wide ranging conversation. But I should say that the FCDO also provides funding through CSSF uh, uh, fund for environment and climate change work. The biodiversity strategy in, in response to Noble Collins is being consulted upon right now. Um, it is happening. 
My, my lords, uh, we continue to support the territories in building their resilience to hurricanes and disaster response. That includes FCDA funding for annual training equipment warning systems. We provide operational support from next week. HMS Dauntless will be there, ready to act if necessary. I want to pay tribute to the regiments and defense forces in Bermuda Turks and Caicos, Montserrat and Cayman, uh, which will play a key role as first responders when natural disasters affect the overseas territories. I'm not going to be able to answer all the questions about the uh, regiments and the ballot uh, recognition. I have a good answer for the noble lord. I'm going to follow up if he doesn't like afterwards. Um, uh, the, uh, likewise, in relation to the Bermuda regiments, uh, regiments battle honors, uh, we are working on this. I know colleagues in the Ministry of Defense are looking closely at the issue now, but I will give them a fuller answer in due course. Um, and on visas, we, we know that it's vital that, that British nationals, um, uh, students with British overseas territories, citizens, passports are able to study in the UK. This is an ongoing issue. I can re reassure the noble lord and others that I have written very strong terms to the Home Office Minister um, on this issue, and we're following up and making ourselves as big a pain in the backside as possible to ensure that we resolve that issue. Um, and on girl guiding, yes, it's beyond our control as a government, but it's an issue that has been raised by me and by others. And then finally, in response on this issue, um, on state pensions, uh, Noble Baroness Bennett raised the point that this was also raised at the JMC. I committed to following up with DWP, which I am on the cusp of doing, um, and I very much hope we'll be able to resolve the issue with them. But it's not a, I can't promise any particular outcome because it's beyond my control, I'm afraid. On security and borders, um, very briefly, because one of our key priorities for the OTs, we're investing 18 million in security for the Caribbean through our integrated security fund. In the BVI, we're working with the government to improve governance, increase law enforcement. In Turks and Caicos, irregular migration, serious crime are really threatening to overwhelm that island. And the Foreign Office has taken measures to date, including tendering for maritime surveillance aircraft, training law enforcement officers, helping fund electronic border infrastructure but it is absolutely crucial for the Home Office to deploy their expertise and resources to prevent the territory from being overwhelmed, which could happen. Um, so we will continue to work very hard on this issue as well, and I will continue to lobby uh, counterparts in other departments of government to ensure that every department of government fulfills their responsibilities in full to the overseas territories. On Gibraltar, likewise, very pleased to see representatives here. Uh, I will reassure you that we're continuing to work with Gibraltar to conclude a treaty with the EU covering uh, its interests. Um, we, we, I'm, I'm going to not be able to go into details now, other than to say that we are steadfast in our support for Gibraltar and will not agree to anything at all that questions or compromises on sovereignty. And I, I realize I am over time, but I do feel obliged to answer the point made by Noble Lord Cashman, echoed by Noble Lord Collins, uh, on, on equal marriage. Um, I want to thank him for his work on this issue and say that I, as you would expect personally, very strongly agree with the points he's made. But policy on marriage is an area of devolved responsibility. That is simply a fact. And for the territories, it is their responsibility to legislate. A lot of progress has been made. It's worth acknowledging that the majority of territories do have legal protections and recognition for same-sex relationships, and we are working hard to encourage others to do the same. Um, I know that's not the answer he was hoping for, but we have to respect the fact that these islands are not, you know, they're not so subjects of direct rule from Westminster, and they have is a process they have to follow. I can see um, that, that, that I need to bring this to end. So I'm just going to thank <coughs> the overlords for their contributions. Territory is really absolutely important. Family, um, deeply committed, uh, it, myself, directly, others to ensuring that we do everything we need, both constitutionally and morally, to support these wonderful overseas territories, and we'll continue to do so. My Lord, the Grand Commission.